All right. Well, good morning. Good to see you folks all here this morning. And uh, <clears throat> before I get started, I do want to make a little bit of an announcement. There is a sign-up sheet back on the little desk as you go out. If you want to bring a dish for the dinner on the 27th, uh, you can sign up there and let us know what's going on. So that's all the announcements. So uh, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 6. This morning we're starting what will be a three-part study on the office of the deacon. The reason for that is we are at that point in time where we need to be selecting deacons for the church. So I want everybody to understand what the office of the deacon is and how important it is. And uh, so I'm going to make sure that you have a clear understanding of it. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, I thank you for allowing us once again to assemble here in your house and Lord, to study your word. And Father, I just pray just now, Lord, that you would help me to teach this lesson this, that you've given me uh, clearly, concisely, and very understandable. And Father, I pray for everybody that hears this, that they will understand exactly what you expect. And Father, I pray that you would help me to be able to see a little bit better here as I try to read your word. I'm having little issues this morning with that. And uh, Father, just uh, pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct everything that's said and done here. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are at that time in our church where we're looking into the future. We are a local New Testament church, a rare Bible-based local New Testament church, and I want us to move forward keeping that in mind. We must continue to function as a biblical church, not just a Christian church, and there's a big difference. We need to ensure that we are doing everything the right way according to Scripture. Now, I'm not saying that we're not doing things right, but I am saying we can do things better, and we need to. There's always room for improvement. We have and will continue to always attempt to do everything in the most, most biblical manner possible. So I want to take some time over the next two or three weeks, next three weeks actually, and remind us of what the biblical purpose and role of the office of the deacon is. That's this week. Next week, we're going to talk about the qualifications. And then we're going to look at how that applies right here to us. So I believe that since you are the ones who select the deacons and are ultimately the ones most affected by how the deacons deacon, you need to pay attention. You need to understand what the deacons are for, what their duties are, their purpose. You need to understand perfectly. Because if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, then you need to hold them accountable, as do I.
you cannot and I cannot hold someone accountable for doing their job if you don't know what their job is, I don't know what their job is, and more importantly, they don't know what their job is. So over these next three weeks, we're all going to know what their job is, what's expected of them, so that we will be holding them accountable. It wouldn't be fair to hold somebody accountable for a job that they haven't had explained to them. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. It says, And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Parcharus, and Nacor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we're seeing here the first deacons being selected. The laying of the foundation for the deacons in the church. The first thing that I want us to see is that there was a problem in the church that brought this about. Verse 1 says, And in those days when the members... And the numbers of the disciples were multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. People's physical needs were not being met. This caused divisions in the church. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. So the problem that they had in this, this early church was they wasn't all speaking the same thing with the same mind and the same judgment. There was murmurings in the church. There was divisions in the church. So the disciples seen that there was a problem that needed to be addressed. So they gave us the solution. Look at verses 2 and 3. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they, they understood that there was a problem. They also understood that it wasn't a problem that they could take care of. They needed help. So the solution is mandated. Appoint men from among you to fill this need. Verse 4. 
the word deacon comes in your Strong's Concordance number 1247 diaconia to serve The same word is used in verse 2 where it says that we can't leave the word to serve tables. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we're going to spend our time next week, but in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon. That is translated from that same word, the akanoe, or however you say it, the Greek word, 1247, if you want to look it up. It means to serve. So it says, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Then verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon, same word, will purchase to themselves a good degree and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the first purpose of the deacon is to serve. Everything else comes off of that. The very name deacon means serve. In our passage here in, in Acts chapter 6, remember this is the foundational passage. And so the qualifications that it gives are the foundational qualifications. The first one is of an honest report. The second one is full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. As I said, next week we will be looking in depth at these qualifications. That's the two foundational qualifications. So we see the problem. There's needs in the church that cannot be met by the leadership of the church, by the pastor, or in this case, the 12. So they tell the people, the solution is, they tell the people, you appoint men from amongst you to take care of this stuff, of this servant stuff. Verse 2 says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry, to the ministry of the word. The twelve or the pastor would be freed to study and minister the word of God and for prayer. That is the primary purpose of the pastor. There are three essential elements that the pastor needs to accomplish his purpose. The first one is time. Verse 4 says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Verse 2 says, It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. I've told you this many times. Every member of the church has a responsibility. If we're not all doing our part, then none of us can properly do our part. So the first thing and the most important thing foundationally is time. The second thing 
is prayer. And you say, well, prayer should be first. Well, wait a minute. You've got to have time to pray. Amen. And I agree that everything begins with prayer. When you have the time to pray, you need to use that time wisely. And study. It's impossible to minister if you are not prepared with the word. That's why they said it is not reason that we should leave the word of God. It's not reason. It's not a good idea. My personal testimony on this is I struggle with time. There never seems to be enough of it. Amen. So I have to be very careful how I use my time. That's why oftentimes when somebody asks me to do this or to do that, I say, I don't have time. I have a job that takes on the job 50 hours a week. I have 20 minutes in the morning driving in, probably 40, 45 minutes in the evening driving home. So there's another five hours a week. So now we're looking at 55 hours a week of my time. I also have a wife whom I love and a house that I need to take care of. And I need to pray and I need to study so that I can minister to you. So there's going to be times well, you think I should be here or I should be there or I should be doing this or I should be doing that and I am not going to be there because I don't have time. I want to make sure you understand that. It's not that I don't want to be, but my priority is prayer, my wife, my home, and my study and ministry. Wanted to get that clear so there would be no question about it. Because I know there has been. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus. I don't know why they had to put all these names in here. And... Nicanor and Timon and Permenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So the people chose their servants, their deacons, based on the qualifications that was laid out by the twelve. Those qualifications were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom and men of honest report. Deacons must be chosen based on on qualifications not on popularity I don't care how much you like somebody if they don't have the qualifications they're not qualified period deacons are chosen 
by the people, but appointed to their positions by the pastor. That's all laid out in the handbook. We're going to talk about that week three. Look at verse six. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The apostles approved them by prayer and laying on of hands. As I said, we'll look at the process of, of installing the deacons here a little more in depth, or a lot more in depth, in week three. But I want to make something understandable to you so that there's no confusion. You will select the men whom you feel have the qualifications to be a deacon. You will write their names down on a piece of paper and give them to me. We'll collect them. I will then take my time and I will talk to each one of these guys individually and privately and confidentially. for a few reasons. One of those reasons is to see if they want to be a deacon. The other reason will be to talk about qualifications and responsibilities. Because I don't want anyone to take that position not knowing exactly what I'm expecting, what God's expecting of them. And then we'll talk about their personal walk. Give them an opportunity to be completely honest with themselves and with their pastor. Totally confident. But it's necessary. You'll see why next week. So the apostles approved them by prayer and laying on of hands. These are men that <clears throat> should be, if we do it right, called by the Holy Ghost. Selected by you, the people. There shouldn't be any problems once they get put into office. Verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The word of God increased and the numbers of the people multiplied because they was doing it the right way. So, were the apostles doing something bad? No. They just wasn't doing everything the best way. And God always wants us to do everything the best way. Now, that might not always be the most popular way. Oh, well. If it's the best way, we just have to get used to it. When they got in line with God, He gave the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9 says this. It says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, 
but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. See, we are to all labor together, but each one of us, when we stand before the Lord, each one of us will be rewarded for our individual labor. If we read further on in that passage, which we're not going to, we would also see that we can suffer loss for what we didn't do in that laboring together. We are a body. Every member is important. Every member. Every member has a purpose in God's heart. When you got saved, God saved you with a purpose. You choose whether you're going to fulfill that purpose or not. And you will be rewarded accordingly. When we all minister our part, God gives the increase because, folks, no one person can accomplish God's plan alone. Have you ever thought about it? If one person could accomplish it, why wouldn't God have just uh, saved, say, Paul? He was a, a go-getter. And say, okay, Paul, you go and you evangelize the world and everybody that comes to Christ, I'm just going to bring them home with me. You take care of the work here. Wouldn't have worked. I can, and I'm just, I'm just giving an example here. I can lead one person to the Lord at a time, usually. Once in a while you get lucky and you get two at a time. Now, addition is, I just added two to the body of Christ. So, hours, days, weeks later, I have the privilege of leading another person to Christ. What's happened? I've added one more. But what about these two? Now, they go out and they win two people to Christ. So now, from these two, we now have six, if I did my math right. I'm doing it in my head and that may not be right. I have an accountant friend down here. He'll tell me later if I'm right or not. That, my friends, is called multiplication. See? So, you and I, as individuals, can only win a few. But if we win those few, and we properly train those few, then they can go win their few. Now we're not adding to the church, we're multiplying to the church. And I'm not talking about in this building, that would be great, but I'm talking about to the body of Christ. Yeah. So that's what verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Isn't that cool? Why? Because these 12 disciples of Jesus understood that they, wasn't, they couldn't possibly do everything that needed to be done. So they told the folks, Select you out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And they're going to take care of the stuff that we can't. And the numbers multiplied. No one person 
can accomplish God's plan alone. God never intended for him to. Ephesians chapter 4. For the sake of time, we're going to look at verses 11, 12, and 16. Verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God set up all these different offices within the church. And if you notice, they're not all the same. It says, and, and, he, and He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Not everybody is an evangelist. Some of us really struggle with that. Some people, it just comes out of them and they can't help themselves. That's good. That's the way God intended it. God never made us all the same. We're a body. But it takes all of us. Look, look at what it says in, in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We can't function if the whole body isn't working together. I've got some testimonies in the room. When your knees aren't working, the rest of you has a real hard time working. We got a laugher out there. She knows all about it. I got another one over there. She's just looking at me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have that problem. When your back is hurting, you can't function like you used to function. You can't function like you want to function. So somebody has to pick up the slack. That's why the Bible says that we are the body of Christ and members in particular. Man. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, watch this, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Every joint. There's not a joint in this room that's not important to the body. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. Most of us come in that latter category. But it doesn't matter. God still wants to use us. You know how I know that? Because we're still alive. Our heart is still beating. So God is not done with us yet. We're important, important to the body of Christ. It says, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Every part is important. If you think it's not, my wife and I was talking about this yesterday, you never notice how important your thumb is until you hit it with a hammer. And then everything you touch, it hurts. And you go, wow, that is part of the body. And right now it's significant. I tell you, we have a coffee table, and it's got these legs. Satan designed his coffee table. These legs are made like this, and they kind of stick out under the edge of it. <clears throat> Just so you know, I am a charm school dropout. Every time I go walking through the living room, not every time, but multiple times, I will kick 
the leg on that coffee table. That thing has been there since 2012. And I still do it. The other day, I split my big toenail way back into the meat. And yes, indeed, that big toe is part of the body. That thing has bothered me now for weeks. I put my socks on and it's like, oh my God, you know. It's terrible when I put my shoes on. Yes. It's finally getting better. But I'm, telling, I'm just telling you folks, it, every part of the body is critically important. Critically important. And when one part of the body is hurting, the whole body is hurting. So there's the problem. And this happens sometimes in churches. Pastors don't want to relinquish control of their church. So they try to control, to be in control of everything and nothing gets done right. You, my friends, are blessed. You have a pastor that don't want to be in control of everything. I don't think like that. I know my job. I know my calling. My job, my calling, is to teach you the Word of God not to be in control of everything. The church, including this church, belongs to God. Amen. It is not my church. It is God's church. It is not my ministry. It's God's ministry. And I know that sometimes I say my ministry. I am a steward of the ministry that God has entrusted me with, but it's His ministry. Amen. It's not mine. I serve Him. And right now, I serve Him right here. Therefore, I don't worry about somebody taking my job or kicking me out of the church because I know who put me here and I know that when he's ready for me to go I'm out of here my prayer is I will be up here preaching some morning or some evening and we'll all just go whew, right through the roof Amen. meet Jesus in the air and ever be with the Lord I pray for that. I really do. Because this, this is the most joyful thing that I do in my life. Is come here and teach the Word of God to you. So I don't worry about it. Because I know who put me here. And I know that I am going to be here until He takes me out of here. And I have had the however you want to put it, I started to say the awesome privilege, but a couple of times it was, of God moving me when I didn't really want to go. But when He makes it abundantly clear, it's abundantly clear. And right now, it's abundantly clear that I'm right where He wants me to be. Amen. And I'm good with that. I'm real good with that. And I pray that it stays that way. Like I said, until we all just go whoof, right out of here. Amen. I just want you to know that God left me here and God put me in this particular church to teach you the Word of God. To raise up young men and young ladies, old men and old ladies to better know the Word of God than what they did yesterday. 
That's my goal. I just want us to function in our ministry as close to perfectly biblical as we can get. That means that God has to be in charge. That means that every part of the ministry must be fulfilling their role in God's ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm just going to look at verses 25 through 27. I will encourage you to go read the whole chapter when church is over. Verse 25 says that there should be no schism in the body. In other words, I get, it was said earlier that they'd all be of one mind, of one voice. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You may not like me, but my friends, you are stuck with me because we're all part of the same body. Amen. And I'm not ready to be amputated yet. You're with me. Stay with me. So the purpose of the deacon, and I'm going to wrap it up here. The purpose of the deacon is to serve both the pastor and the church body. They serve, now pay attention, they serve the pastor by actually serving the church body. I don't ask for much. But I ask that the deacons serve the body like they're supposed to. Because if you guys do that, you're serving me like you're supposed to. Only when the deacons do their job can the pastor be freed up to do his. My friends, the role of the deacon is extremely, extremely, extremely important to the body of Christ. In closing, I want to read one more verse in Acts chapter 6. It's verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen was the first deacon selected. He was also the first deacon martyred. He was critical to the functioning of the body of Christ then and still to this day. Keep in mind, keep in your prayers, selecting the deacons is extremely important to this church going forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for your holy word. That, Father, everything that we come up against in our Christian walk. You have the answer for it in your word if we will just take the time to study it out. To read, to pray, to study. And Father, I pray that this message today came across with the spirit with which it was given. Father, it's a time in our church where we must 
be very serious about the selection of the deacons, the leaders of the church, those men who will take us forward into the future. And Father, I just pray that everybody that's involved here, everybody that's a part of this church, that's a member of this church, will think seriously and soberly on the things that we've seen today. How important it is to the body of Christ. <coughs> Help us, Lord, to make the right choices, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.